Benchmark, the voice of business. Presented by LMD. On this edition of Benchmark, in the hot seat today is Dr. Sepali Kotagura, Director of Women and Media Collective, and she gives us her expert opinion on gender equality. Then, Asoko Besekara, Governance Consultant of Verite Research, discusses the post-election scenario. And we talk to TNS Lanka's Country Manager, Mihirani Disanayaka, for her analysis of TNS's recent island-wide survey. That's the lineup for Benchmark. Welcome to another edition of Benchmark. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. In our studio today is Dr. Sepali Kotagoda, who is the Executive Director of Women and Media Collective. This is an organization that is actively engaged in bringing about change based on principles to create a very just society that does not tolerate gender discrimination. So here we are with Sepali, who will give her expert opinion. Sepali, thank you so much for being here because this is one subject that is very close to all our hearts. Um, how do you view the role of women in contemporary Sri Lanka today? I think today in Sri Lanka we are seeing uh, uh, the visibility of women is m probably highest uh, in, in recent times. Uh, we see them in the uh, labor force. Uh, we see them uh, actively engaging with political processes. Uh, we see them in activism uh, on, on uh, various social issues at national level, at uh, local level as well. So I think we have, we are, uh, I think we are, in a, we are at a juncture where we can draw on all the potential of women in this country. Okay. When you look at gender equality, how does Sri Lanka compare with the other developed countries in this region? When we look at gender equality, because gender in itself is a concept we need to understand, and that's the not the biological difference, but the socially uh, instilled differences between women and men. Uh, in to some extent, I think uh, if when we look at it in terms of access to uh, education, most certainly there is no visible discrimination. Uh, against girls and bo uh, g girls and women, uh, when we look at access to healthcare, you know these are the two areas where I think we Sri Lanka stands out uh, ex as exceptional, uh, as having e achieved exceptional standards uh, in in South Asia and in many countries, in many developing countries. So in that sense, we are closer to the developed countries in terms of accessing social uh, care and uh, uh, education. But when we look at issues like where the women are in the labor force, it's mostly in the lower echelons. When we look at issues such as uh, violence, uh, and, and as you are, you, may, you are aware, we brought in legislation on domestic violence uh, through the Prevention of do gender, uh, Domestic Violence um, in 2005. So the, but if we read the newspapers, if we see what's happening, it's still very much an uh, issue. So when we look at access to actually uh, higher paying jobs, we see there are differences and there are discriminatory practices that lead, that actually I think uh, are the root of these differences. Um, Sepali, there was, uh, you know, for decades, people like you have been fighting for better political representation in parliament for women. Now, there are two sides to the story. One is that if you bring in a quota, all kinds of women will be just put in just to meet the needs of the quota. On the other side, the preferential system, as we have seen, just removes even the good women out of the system and just leaves you know, us wanting to find out what happened. Now, what can we do and how can and must Sri Lanka address that issue of increasing the representation of women in parliament? Not only in parliament, but in provincial councils, in local government, everywhere. I think, okay, in the last few weeks, this whole political system has been, ha came up as a, as a critical issue. 
I think many parties acknowledged that the proportional representation system in this country is actually has not worked, has not brought the dividends that was expected, it was expected to bring. And uh, most certainly when we look at uh, the, the representation of women in the main political arena in this country, I think we should really hang our he heads in shame. Because while at on, one, on, one, on the one side, uh, if this question is posed to many male politicians, they will say we had the first prime minister in the world, we have had a woman president. True, no one denies it, one should acknowledge it and value it. But what about the rest? Why is it that they are not being, why is it that women who have come into mainstream politics, whether it's at local government, at provincial or at parliamentary level, why is it that they are not represented? So we do need to seriously uh, revisit and, um, and I think, um, well, bring about a different kind of uh, political system. But also I think we do need quotas. We do need quotas because we look at, uh, we just have to look at what has happened in other so South Asian countries. And women come with certain, uh, uh, I think, far more challenges into the political arena than perhaps I could say, of course it's a blanket term, than men. So we do need quotas. And, we, and we, what we would advocate is quotas at local government level for a specific, this is called a temporary special measure. That is, this, it's a time-bound uh, quota, which quota system, which means that women come in at local government. They have the opportunities to uh, to, to work in that uh, in that uh, system, in the local government system, and to prove their worth. You know, you were talking about women, the labor force participation, 36.4 in the first quarter of 2015, which is really quite not good yes. enough. What more? can we do to improve women's participation in the labor force? The women's participation in the labor force is, has always been almost half that of men. And it, yes, we can have more uh, uh, employment opportunities. We can have uh, uh, employment opportunities and also education and training to have women more versatile in, in the kind of occupations they can access. And uh, we can also have programs where the employers are encouraged to, you know, to employ women who are qualified. We, and that, that is a, it's not a short term thing, it's a long term process. The other, but this leads on to another issue. Why is it that women's labor force participation is so low? Now, do, when, do we, can we compare with countries where the labor force participation of women is high or higher? Because that is, in that case, when we look at those, uh, those kinds of t contexts, there has been a social infrastructure that gives, that support families, that support childcare, uh, good, you know, childcare with qualified personnel, not, not the kind of uh, institutions that we have here, which is mostly unregulated, where women are also given flexi time where the gender roles of looking after family, because the primary reason for the low representation of women in the formal labor force is the fact that they are bound by their uh, family uh, uh, so-called duties. It is very gendered thing, you know, men are as capable of looking after children as m women, but society says it's only the woman who can do something, which I think we need to question. But this is what I was saying, okay, this leads on to what about all the work that is done within the home, uh, which is never enumerated, which is never really recognized as contributing to the economy? When we uh, take the services of a, a domestic worker, we pay that person a salary, okay? For the work that the woman does, a mother, a wife, a daughter, you know, would do in the home. So I think we need to, and, and this is called unpaid care work. And I think we have to, the economy, the economists, uh, the policy uh, makers, the policy planners, have to recognize that the work that is done, the 
care work that is done within the home has to be recognized, enumerated. Lots of interesting issues you're raising. Um, we're going to take a commercial break now, Sepali. So time for a commercial break, but when we get back on the other side, Dr. Sepali Kotegoda discusses how the migration of women for short-term employment actually impacts the economy and the role of media in portraying women. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. We can show you a world Shining, shimmering, splendid Amazing, beautiful, dazzling, wondrous place for you and me A whole new world The future's got a whole new world for you The most advanced technology now on multiple smart devices for total convenience Welcome to HMB New World Banking And so we are back with a very interesting discussion we've been having on women, the issues they face, gender discrimination, equality, etc. With Dr. Sepali Kotegoda, who's the Executive Director of Women and Media Collective. Sepali, women going to the Middle East, housemaids, we have something like 88% are employed as housemaids. We have 94% um, of women working in the Middle East. And these are all women between the ages of 24 and 39. Young women, productive women, women who can do a lot if they stayed here. On the other hand, we are all, most of us, living off these uh, women, off the remittances that come in. How has the migration of women for short-term employment overseas actually impacted household economies and society and the national economy as a whole? I think enormously. The uh, remittances of women migrant workers for the last 30 to 40 years has impacted hugely on the national economy. I think there's enough uh, data to show that. And also on their household economies because uh, if, if we look at the number of uh, physical uh, uh, improvement in, in, the, in these households. Many of these women, the remittances uh, have gone to building houses uh, for themselves, for the families, for their daughters to give, be given who, who, you know, as dowry, motor bicycles, trishaws, uh, electricity, you know, so many things. And I think what is is emerging now. I mean, there is a recognition that these, these women have contributed. Uh, but where it's still, I think, a little murky, it's not, not, not murky, really, like a little blurred, is it, where the, the blur comes in is, is actually r recognizing that contribution in, in, a, you know, in, a, in a way that will impact on positioning women in our society, in our country. Uh, we still look at the profession of housemaids as something that uh, some I know some gentlemen told me anyone can do it and I would like to ask can you uh, but it is something that is essential to to you know, in terms of household but also it is something that these women gain skills they, they do improve their skills there is a training that's given by the Sri Lanka Foreign Employment Bureau prior to departure. But I think what they gain in employment or, uh, in, in overseas is, uh, is, has also to be counted. So 
you know, the, the that that's one area. I mean, that's one one way in which we could actually uh, ensure that these women contribute further to their households for themselves and to the national economy is professionalize how, uh, domestic work, build on the skills, give them uh, ex uh, you know an additional training when they come back. I think there's enough, there's a large enough market for professional domestic workers in this country. Similar to what the Philippines yes, is doing, for instance. Exactly. Say, Pali, I'd like to call it a contentious issue because sometimes what I see really irks me. But what is the role of the media in portraying women? Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's a comp, you know, it's not a, it's the, this cannot have a straight, simple answer because uh, the media in itself is a complex web of. Uh, different forms of communication, different target groups, etc. But I think if we want to take on a positivist kind of approach, then we should say the media could uh, f report in a balanced way uh, do and not malign women who may be uh, stepping out of the so-called uh, straight and narrow path. Uh, we do not, uh, we, we would expect the media to give fair representation, fair amount of space uh, in, their, uh, in their programs or newspapers. We, for example, if we look at the very, re you know, the, the elections concluded yesterday, day before yesterday, and the weeks prior to that, then how many women came on those political talk shows? Okay. And how many men? How many women were actually invited to come and give uh, their opinions on what should be national issues? Now, yes, they might, you know, I think the media has a role to, to play there. We have uh, the social media as well. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a completely different uh, arena where the, it's very difficult to control who is saying what. But it is also a space where you can say what you want to say. And if you want to talk talk in terms of positive, if you want to talk about gen equality between women and men, if you want to talk about gender equality, recognize sexual rights, all that can be done through the media. If you looked at an overall vision for social justice, for gender equality, what are the elements you would want that to have, your vision? Most certainly, I would uh, see uh, uh, a policy at policy level gender equality integrated into every single uh, ministry uh, where it informs all policy. It is not something that is isolated and put into the uh, Ministry of Women's Affairs. Uh, women's, the women, uh, Ministry of Women's Affairs is one of the ministries set up by the government, every government since 1981 and however to be successful in bringing about change attitudinal change ideological change in relation to gender equality we need to have gender equality informing all policies national policies and i think we can go towards it we have the opportunities to go towards that and uh, it's I, I my vision is you know where women are equally represented where a uh, young girl can walk on the street, a uh, woman can walk on the street at any time of day or night and not have to be uh, in fear of violence, gender-based violence uh, being inflicted on. Uh, I, would, you know, I would like to see young girls having the, the best opportunities to prove themselves in whichever field they, they decide to uh, be in. And well, certainly, I would. Uh, I w my vision would be also into this is a society uh, devoid of devoid of uh, violence against women. And I'm sure there'll be many males who will join you in trying to achieve that vision too. I'm sure too. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sepali. Well. Thank you. We've been talking to Dr. Sepali Kotegoda, Executive Director of the Women and Media Collective, on gender issues, on issues that are being faced by women, on political representation of women, and also the vision that she would like to see for gender equality and social justice. On the other side, we have Anushan Selvaraja with more.
Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. We can show you a world Shining, shimmering, splendid Amazing, beautiful, dazzling, wondrous place for you and me A whole new world The most advanced technology, now on multiple smart devices for total convenience. Welcome to HMB New World Banking. Hello and welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Anushan Selvaraja. We're going to take a closer look now at the latest on the political situation in this country with Asoko Besekaro of Verite Research. Welcome, Asoko. Now, to begin with, we just finished uh, our latest general election. So, uh, what, what is your overview of the election and its outcome? Well, uh, two points which many uh, commentators had been saying prior to the election, and I think we can agree that it's, it is what has happened now as well, is that no individual party or coalition will have a simple majority in parliament. The second thing is that there will be a national government that's formed using the um, uh, provisions of the 19th Amendment. So those two key things ha have really gone as many people had anticipated. I think there are sort of four key observations though that I could make regarding um, what, has, what the results show us. And it really requires you to focus on the vote share in the different districts. So if we were to, let's say, look at the UPFA, an interesting fact for the UPFA is that they have lost vote share in every district. And in every district, barring Hamban Thota, they have lost, lost over 10% of the vote share in their district. But actually, if you look even closer, in, 22 elector, in 11 of the 22 electoral districts, they have lost over 20% of the vote share. So there's been a big, big swing there. But uh, clearly the southern uh, districts, particularly Hambantota and Mathura, have stayed uh, more solid to the UPFA. Um, with the UNP, one of the key observations is that actually the place where they made their second highest gains in the entire country, I think it was around 24% in the, of the vote share that they gained, it was actually in Polonnaruwa. So the fact that Polonnaruwa and its connection with President Sirisena is there, we, there, there's something interesting there whether actually support for President Sirisena actually uh, is, uh, is seen in votes for the UNP. There's, a, there's, a, there's something worth uh, questioning there. Uh, regarding the Democratic Party and the JVP, what we've seen is last election they, fought, they ran as the DNA coalition. This time round, they ran separately. But actually, when you see the uh, changes in the vote share, the biggest drop in vote share, if you put the DP and the JVP together, is actually in the Colombo district, where they lost around 5% of the vote share from, uh, from last time round. And then when you realize that their leader, Anurag Kumar Disanayaka and Saad Fonseca, so their respective leaders, were both running in the, in the Colombo district, that's very, very interesting uh, to observe. And the final one is for ITAC. And ITAC ran in five districts, so significant gains across the board. But in three districts, being Jaffna, Vanni, and Batiklo, they have seen over 15% increases in vote share in those three districts. So there's some very interesting statistics coming out from this election. But just to refocus it, those two main points at the beginning. No one gets a simple majority on their own. And the fact that there's a national government within, uh, working within the 19th Amendment framework 
those two things were anticipated and those two things have happened. Would you say that voting per se was done intelligently this time? Well, it's a, it's a difficult um, thing to speak about uh, how voters and whether they've used their, cast their vote intelligently. Ultimately, it's the will of the people and intelligence in that sense is a subjective factor. But I think it's fair to say that um, we've seen a greater degree of strategic voting. So, for instance, um, many people were quite uh, surprised when they saw that uh, uh, Prime Minister Vikramasinghe has gone and uh, broken the record of the highest number of preferential votes and things in Colombo. But I think that's also reflective, not necessarily of the popularity of the individual, but it was also reflective of the fact that people had strategically considered the fact that a vote, a preference vote for Ranil Vikramasinghe was important in legitimizing his claim to be the next Prime Minister of Sri Lanka. And people had taken a strategic stance in looking at the different factors and who uh, um, and who the other alternatives were. So that's, that's one factor on the strategy. The second factor on strategy is also when you look at the UPFA votes and you look at the people who have done very uh, well on uh, coming through the UPFA lists, you start realizing that this may be less about the patronage politics that we have seen in the past where local patronage structures mean that a certain people who necessarily don't have a big national presence have got a great deal of votes. On this occasion, it seems as though the people who were the strongest uh, uh, former President Rajapaksa loyalists and who had really pinned themselves to President Rajapaksa from the outset are the people who have done exceedingly well in the preference votes across the country. Asuka, what should the composition of a national government be for it to be uh, most effective? Well. Um, just as a bit of a primer, uh, the 19th Amendment states that the cabinet should be restricted to 30 members and that additional sort of deputy ministers and state ministers shouldn't go beyond 40. So that's a, that's a, but now when there is a national government, those limits are, vanish and it's unrestricted. But I think the important thing to remember is that the composition of the national government should really focus on the policy needs of the country at the moment. And actually, uh, Professor Siri Hettige, who is the head of the sociology department at Colombo University, has worked with people from Manfred.lk, but also worked with many senior um, civil servants, secretaries to ministries, in looking at what the pol those policies should be. And actually, this has been done on the request of President Siri Sena to Professor Hettige. And so what has been produced is a 22-point set of national policies and also the stru structure of the, min of the cabinet and, w uh, and how the other deputy ministers and state ministers should be appointed and the relevant departments that sit under these uh, uh, respective ministries. Because the important thing there is to ensure that the, the appropriate synergies are met. So for instance, it's important maybe that vocational training and um, other things related to education are together so that they're synchronized so that actually vocational training doesn't take place completely without any view of how people go through school. So those are the sorts of synergies that must that should be met and actually I would encourage anyone watching to go to the Mantri.lk blog where these two uh, uh, documents are there. Thank you for joining us Asoka. With pleasure as always. That was Asoka Obeseka Rock Verite Research. After a short commercial break we will be back with the latest on the LMB TNS survey. Stay tuned. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC.
We can show you a world Shining, shimmering, splendid Amazing, beautiful, dazzling, wondrous space for you and me A whole new world The most advanced technology, now on multiple smart devices for total convenience. Welcome to h &B New World Banking. Welcome back to the show. I'm Anushan Selvaraja. Now for a closer look at the latest on the LMB TNS survey. With me is the country manager of 3NS Lanka, Mihirani Bisanayaka. Uh, welcome, Mihirani. Now, just give us a brief overview of the survey this time. Uh, Anushan, this month this uh, survey was about the uh, Sri Lankan relationship with the rest of the world, specifically uh, with countries like India and China. And there was a specific question about how the country is uh, doing on its uh, foreign uh, policies as well. How do respondents perceive a country's foreign policy? Uh, as per the results of this time study, uh, quite a bit of positive response towards the foreign policy. Around 56% of uh, people who we interviewed believe that the po foreign policy is balanced in this country, specifically in this year. Uh, this is mainly attributed to the government that they elected uh, in the month of January. Uh, the other side of the story is uh, who do not believe uh, that the foreign policy is balanced in this country. Uh, see that there's room for improvement. This perception is coming mainly from high affluent group, not necessarily in Colombo, outside, outside Colombo. And people in Colombo is having not sure uh, attitude and approach towards the foreign policy of this country yet. So is having India at our doorstep a good thing according to the respondents? Yeah, the majority, like more than 75% believe that India should remain uh, the priority relation for Sri Lanka. This is uh, mainly due to two reasons. One is geographic proximity between countries and other uh, reason is being the historical relationship that we are having with India. The, the small percentage who do not agree to the fact that India should be the priority relations believe that our relationship with India has gone down uh, during the last couple of year, months or years. And on the other side, uh, they believe that India is trying to control the country. So this has driven that their disagreement to this statement. Where do respondents stand when it comes to our country's uh, relationship with China? It's understand probably the obvious. Uh, majority like 74% believe that China is very important for our development plan. And uh, obviously, people have seen their contribution and what kind of funds raised by China for our infrastructure development and how China led most of the construction project in this country. Because of this, they believe that China is an important party for our relationship and we need to maintain a healthy relationship with China. Thank you for joining us, Mihirani. Thank you. That was the country manager of TNS Lanka, Mihirani Disanayaka. Thank you for watching Benchmark and we hope to see you again next time.